professionals up here. Sorry about the words being messed up and for you smiling at me so sweetly when I did that. to keep guys, going and going and going. Greet, you guys greet one another this morning. Grab a cup of coffee and orange juice if you like. Say hello and be grateful that you are here today in the house of the Lord. Cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus fled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. Deep down. 
conference was called the Neighbors Conference. It was designed to instruct and encourage the church to be actively involved in the work of Jesus Christ. And one of the, the key leaders of this particular conference and in the city as a whole uh, is Mr. Clarence Hill. Clarence is about that tall. One of the most eloquent well-spoken, educated pastors I've ever been around, who was spending most of his life in Oklahoma City working on racial reconciliation, and his dream church was one that was a diverse church full of all different races and ages and backgrounds, and God has called him to a live church, a, 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 a working church in Norman, where there's 600 members, and the only non-white members are he and his family right now. And he said, what an irony that God has called us to this. And I was thinking to myself, Clarence, you need to come visit the well. It's a beautiful example of all shapes and sizes and colors and backgrounds. And it is something I want to continue to point out to you as something that I honor you for. Your specific, visible example that you have chosen to be in showing young people that the kingdom of God is not colorblind, but it equally values all colors. It's not gender blind, but it equally values both genders that God has given us. That it sees God's people on a continuum of infinite love. We're all the same for our Father. So I want to affirm you for being here today, for being with people that are unlike you, maybe racially or culturally, but being with people who are like you and that we are brothers and sisters in the family of God. I'm so glad to be here with you. And I pray that, that Brother Clarence will be able to bring this kind of a vision to a live and active church, Antioch Church in Norman, that is seeking to take the gospel to all the, all the corners of this globe, that they will become integrated even in their community as well. Let's continue to sing our praises to our God. It is useful to look back on those, those moments in our life where we were changed by God to, to become the new creatures that we are. This song declares that. We will remember. We will remember. We will remember. We will remember.
my about my being saved. Right. Sorry. I still remember that day you saved me. Collectively and individually, if we think about what God has saved us from and saved us to, we are, we're all across the board. Some of us grew up in homes that drug us to church every single Sunday, and some of us never saw or heard God spoken of or exemplified in our lives at all. Some of us moved through most of our childhood knowing Jesus, and some of us didn't even meet him until we were adults. Some of us came out of confusion and and religion that obscured the real God into a light that declared Jesus as our Savior. What a cool thing to consider those who stand here and God's remarkable grace through each one of our stories. If we think about how each of us were saved, we should just be praising God right now. That he would save me out of my pride and sin us into a life of value and worth and assignment for him, that he would bring us from confusion and doubt and brokenness into healing, to restructure our lives, to rewire our minds, to restore our souls. Praise God. Praise God. Be reminded today of your salvation. And praise God.
God gave us cycles of time where we know when one week ends and the next one begins and that he allows us to begin a week praising him. What a beautiful day, right? What a great way to start a week. Inspired or discouraged by the week past, it's still the week past. We move forward in his will this week. Hopeful, because we are people who have real hope, that the kingdom will come and his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We can struggle, we can get upset, but we can't be without hope. We have to maintain our belief and our faith that our God is faithful to what he said he would do. Amen? Here we go, new week starting over.
just breaks a man breaks him down to his knees God I've been broken more than a time or two yes Lord then he picked me up he picked me up and showed me what it means to be saved Come on now. nice to sing truth like that? Beautiful. Father, thank you for letting us sing your truth back to you, for you giving it to us in our hearts, in our music, in our minds. We pray that today we will grasp what you would have us grasp from your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Are we good now? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'm, I'm always, I'm going to share a personal struggle with you guys. It's not a deep, dark personal struggle. It's just a struggle. And I still don't know how to reconcile it, but I'm going to share it anyway. Because I feel better to share when I have struggles, even if I don't solve them. I don't know if I should write my sermons or just speak. Um, when I write my sermons, I'm very careful to craft the ideas and the words. But the problem when I write my sermons is I have to do what with them? i got to read them to you, right? And I've noticed that when I'm listening or attempting to listen to someone who's reading sermons or a message or a lecture, well, maybe it's just me. How do you react when someone is reading something most of the time? Isn't it? I don't know why. It's harder to focus. I think it's because we know they're not looking at us. I think there's something about that. When someone is engaged with the written word in front of them, I'm not quite as accountable to make eye contact with them. I think there's something about that. When a, when a teacher is quoting a passage versus reading a passage, we pay more attention to that. Um, but sometimes when I speak off the cuff or less scripted, I miss things that I really want to tell you. Things that I've really thought about, but then I forget I was supposed to say them. So I don't, know, I don't have a solution. I'm just telling you right now. I'm going to try to do both today. So here's, here's my proposed idea. When you see me looking down to read, make a conscious decision to not disengage. All right? So I know for me it's harder. When someone's reading, I have to pay more attention. But I'm really, and I will try to read if I read something well to you so it makes some sense to you. So once again, I think that as we really consider this, if we, if we were honest, and you have to be honest because you're Christians and you're supposed to do that stuff. If we were honest about our faith, and we sort of pushed back from our faith and said, if we were to analyze the tenets of our beliefs, we would have to say we're a little, okay, a lot, nuts. Most of the foundational things that we hold to be true fly in the face of science, 
of logic and don't even make it easy for us to describe because they're either difficult concepts to understand or they're difficult concepts like grace to believe God can offer us. So almost everything that we hold to be a foundational truth, if we really thought about this, makes us seem a little absurd. A little absurd. And I would tell you right now, I sort of dwelled on this a bit, and I, I don't really have a problem with that. Because if, I think people are going to think I'm crazy anyway. I want them to think I am really intentionally, consistently crazy. Right? I don't want there to be any wavering in my ludicrous nature. I want people to know that if I say I believe that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, that I always believe that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. And I don't seek some sort of weird scientific anomaly to explain away what the scriptures specifically say was going to happen and did happen. I don't want people to wonder if I really believe that Jesus lived a perfect life. Because the Bible says he lived a perfect life, that he was a spotless lamb sent by God to live a perfect life so that when he would be crucified for our sins, his death would be meaningful to pay as recompense for us our sins, to make us right, to justify us before God. I don't want anybody to think that at some point in my life, my belief in Jesus' perfection wavers. I want to be consistently absurd in that claim. I want them to know that as logical as I think I am in all of these other areas, I think it is just as logical that the God who created the laws of the universe from the beginning could overcome the laws of the universe and overcome death itself to come back from being murdered so that he could prove he was God of the universe. That's crazy. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Jesus was dead. He rose from the dead. I believe that. Most of you believe that. But we got to believe that. We can't begin to allow doubt to creep in. Because then you're just a weak minded human being right we have to be foundationally strong in these ideas so we're we're talking about these ideas these absurd claims of christ followers and declaring them to be true we we spoke a little bit about creeds and we'll talk about that a little bit later but i want us to think a little bit about this that our work to grasp the eternal is tough in light of the temporal we can't even think about a time outside of time because we're bound by time. Does that make sense a little bit? It's hard to conceptualize something you've never experienced. We can think about it. We can theorize it, but to really feel it is just like, whew. We can wonder about it, but we, 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 tr we struggle with that. To accept life after death when all we have ever, ever experienced was life and then death. There is nothing in our experience or any other human being's experience except those who saw Jesus rise from the dead that would tell us there is life after death. And yet we declare that to be true. We have no experiences, nothing from our five senses that will tell us this is true and yet we cling to this. To conceive of higher truths, in fact, a meta-narrative of truth that undergirds all expectations of humanity, when all of humanity says that truth is relative, is a foolish notion. We look around our world and people say, truth is what you make of it. And we say, no, truth has made us of it. The God of truth has declared things to be right, things to be wrong, Things to be yes, things to be no, things to be true and untrue, and they are unchangeable. Well, everything around us is changing and shifting. A society moves its perspective from one view of the family to another, or one idea about gender specificity to another, or one idea about whatever to the other. It's always inconsistent. And we declare that we follow a God who is consistent. We then must acknowledge that to accept perfect love and sacrifice from a God in our experience that there is no perfect love and all sacrifice is ultimately impure in humanity, to accept that this is the truth of God is an absurd claim. So let's not try to get around it. 
by the world's definition, the things that we say we believe are crazy talk. So let that line be drawn in the sand and say, okay, by your standard, however much it moves around, everything I say to be true based on what the scriptures teach me will be unreasonable. And I will still then choose, which is faith in action, to follow these concepts with my life. Some of us get bound up trying to explain away or conceptualize or make our ideas of humanity uh, the guide to understand our God. And our God is not human and his ways are higher and his mind is bigger and his love is greater. And all of these things are beyond our comprehension. And so we cannot fully understand God, but we must fully place our faith in God. Hebrews 11.1 1 reminds us of this. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Now, that is either the most profoundly comforting passage or it is the writings of an intelligent lunatic. Because the writer of Hebrews declares that we should have Confidence in what we hope for, not what we can prove, not what we've experienced. Have confidence, take it to the bank, and assurance, a guarantee in something we can't see. And that's what we're called to. Our faith is, and by the world's standards, unreasonable faith. Can you deal with that? Can you accept that? That really is an interesting question. When around us, we are taught to have a reasonable faith in everything human, to believe in science, to believe in medical technology, to believe in government, to, be, to believe in statistical analysis, to believe in mathematics, because we can see and prove these things. The writer of Hebrews says, you need to believe in these things even though you cannot prove these things. Of course, the rest of chapter 11 goes on to exemplify the mighty men and women of faith in the scriptures. And at the end of it, it even says, they didn't see this stuff that they believed in even come to be during their lifetimes, and yet they did not waver from their faith. And it lists one after the other after the other. Man, if you want to be encouraged, read Hebrews 11. Read Hebrews 11, and then think kind of in your private thoughts about how cool it would be to have your name listed in there as a hero of the faith. Last week we discussed the importance of having a good grasp of these fundamental Christian beliefs, and we noted that these beliefs are founded in Scripture and have been confirmed by men and women of faith and are the bedrock of our collective understanding of our relationship with God, this alignment, as well as our understanding of how we are to relate to other human beings, this alignment. So these sort of creedal statements that we make have to be absorbed so that we know how to relate to God the Father and how we should be relating to the other messed up human beings around us. It's pretty basic instructions when you think about it, but that's what we're to hold to. We looked at the Nicene Creed and, uh, and glanced at the Apostles' Creed, and these are two statements of faith which outline the key beliefs of any Christian doctrine. We also noted that having a clear knowledge and understanding of these beliefs and the scriptures that undergird them is central to becoming a Christian. Now, we believe in this autonomy of the believer to the nth degree. And we should, of course, do that, right? Uh, but sometimes I think we miss the boat. In school, we, we have had the audacity in schools to say, man, there are just some foundational standards kids got to know. They got to know. You can't just go to school and just learn whatever the heck the teacher thinks you ought to learn. There's some things you got to learn. Because what if you have a third grade teacher who doesn't think reading's important and is passionate about it? Those kids will not learn how to read. So we need some standards to hold us accountable. Now, we don't have much of that standard work done in our churches because we value individual autonomy. I almost think we should have a test every Sunday, right? Oh, now you're getting nervous, aren't you? Right? I'm going to be calling in sick that day. Is it, is it an open book test? Oh, maybe, maybe not, right? What are these foundational tenets? The Catholics have it in other faiths. It's called catechism. You go to class to learn the important things that you need to know about your faith. 
The Mormons do it. They go to a seminary where they're in high school. Their children, their junior and senior year, go to two hours of seminary from 5.30 to 7.30 in the morning before they go to school. Because it's important to learn the tenets of their faith. The Jewish children went to religious education for years. I think sometimes we've allowed ourselves to be off the hook in these ways. So dig in a little bit today. And the Baptist faith and message is the Southern Baptist articulation of our biblical stance on any number of guiding principles. And these are the principles that we practice based on the biblical guidance in our denominational stance. Denominations are not created by God, by the way. Neither is religion. They're not. But your chosen practice of faith often aligns with others who have this chosen practice of faith that you do. And we gather in congregations and we codify those beliefs so we know what we believe and we hang out with folks generally that believe the same way we do. And the Baptist faith and message has taken some of these things, important things, and said, this is what we stand for. These are all backed in Scripture. And if they weren't backed in Scripture, we would not be reading them. But this is in section 10. It outlines the biblical foundation for the last things. The last things that will occur in the human timeline of history. Baptists have looked at Scripture, as have many others, and drawn out some of the fundamental things that we know from the Scripture. And this is what it says in this section. God in his own time and in his own way will bring the world to its appropriate end. I love that statement. God in his time and in his way will bring the world to its appropriate end. It will not be an error. When he erases this program and moves on to the next one, it will be appropriate in the purest sense of the word. According to his promise, Jesus Christ will return personally, personally and visibly in glory to the earth. The dead will be raised and Christ will judge all men in righteousness. The unrighteous will be consigned to hell, the place of everlasting punishment. The righteous in their resurrected bodies will receive their reward and dwell forever in heaven with the Lord. Now, these are human statements, just like the creeds we read before. And they must be tested against what? Scripture, right? And not just the raw words of Scripture, but the context of Scripture and the consistent message of the Word of God from its beginning to its end. So if these things are not found to be true in Scripture, then they are not true. Right? Well, the Baptist faith and message has extensive scriptural affirmation, as do all the creeds, for the statements that they make. But don't take anyone's word for it. You've got a copy of the word in your own language, and you should do your own work. When you own the primary source document, why would you want to listen to somebody quote, 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 quote? Read the thing and know if it's true. In Christianity, this study or this seeking to understand the end times is called eschatology. Some of you have heard that. You're familiar with this. It's, end time. it's a considerable body of work has been done on this over the last 20 centuries or so. This eschatology. And some of it is pretty clear. The world will end. Right? The world will end at God's appropriate time. Jesus will return. Now, there's some, there's some difference of opinion about the exact flow events, exactly what those events will be like, but the, the type and nature of those events should not be questioned by those that read the Word of God. And so we're going to look at that a little bit today. If you look at Acts 1, 7 through 11, it sort of kicks off this whole, uh, well, maybe restarts this whole idea of Jesus' return. You see, the Old Testament writers actually prophesied about Jesus' return. They prophesied about His coming about his virgin birth, about where he was going to be born, how he was going to be treated. But the Old Testament authors actually wrote about his return. They just didn't know that. Some of the things they wrote seemed to indicate they didn't know, they didn't even have this in their mind, that Jesus would be returning, that the Messiah, the saving one from God, would have a need to return. It was probably not something that they thought about. But when they did, they, when they wrote about it, it foretold or foreshadowed the return of Jesus Christ. Acts 1, 7 through 11, just to remind you, we've been here a few times, but he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father is set by his own authority. But you will receive power 
when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. At this point, we should pause and just say, thank you, God. Why should we say thank you, God, at this point? Because we are the ends of the earth, right? We are literally those described, right, as outside of the Jewish faith. He came to the Jew first and then the, all the rest of us, the Gentile. We're not in Jerusalem. We're not in Judea. We're not in Samaria. We are, we are the uttermost parts of the earth. Thank God that the gospel didn't stay in the Middle East. But that it spread throughout time and geography to touch every one of our lives. Thank God that he didn't leave us in darkness as we deserved. God didn't have to share his grace with us. He is under no obligation to offer salvation to anyone. We, by birth and by choice, are depri depraved human beings. But he loved us, the Bible says, so much that he sent his son to save all of us. If we would just believe in him, we can have eternal life through Christ Jesus. Verse 9, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. We talked about this last week. This is the ascension, right? This is one of those ludicrous beliefs that we say that Jesus died, was put in a tomb, was resurrected on Easter morning and began to appear to people. In Acts, we see that he appeared to 500 people over 40 days. And at the end of that period of time, he's with his disciples. We also see this accounted for in the end of Matthew. He's speaking and teaching them. It must have been an intense lesson, right? This is the last physical lesson he is giving his apostles. He must have, uh, guys, I really need your eyes right now. I really need you to pay attention to what I'm saying. They didn't know, but in just a few moments, he literally would be lifted off the ground, levitated. Now, we try to think about this and, and make it a religious thing, but good grief, can you imagine if we're just standing here talking and Matt begins to float up through the ceiling, I'm losing my mind. Aren't you losing your mind? Wouldn't you be terrified? Appalled? I would be like, it would be, it would be an awful gut-wrenching experience to see something like that. And what if it was the Jesus that you had literally just asked, ask, are you going to now restore the kingdom? Are we ready to march on Rome? And he's like, I'm going to send the power of the Holy Spirit on you so you can go, no, nah, we're, we're, we got your back, Jesus. And Jesus said, I got your back. You're going to go do the work that I'm sending you to do. They still had no concept of what was going on. Even when he had told them, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Where are you going? Oh, my gosh. I've told you again and again. He's speaking to them. And at this moment, he is taken up. They are looking, the Bible says, in Luke's succinct words, intently into the sky can you imagine the posture that they would have had doing that i mean i don't think it was like i think they were terrified amazed maybe grasping one another maybe their wee knees got weak and they had to sit down and they were just overwhelmed by this and the bible says that while they're doing it two dudes in white appear beside them and say men of galilee why are you looking up at the sky they knew the answer to that question right it's rhetorical. They followed on that and said this, this same Jesus who you just saw taken away, who's now at the right hand of the Father, will one day, what? Come back in the same manner. This is the first indication that we get in Scripture of the physical return of the actual Jesus. This is the God incarnate who will one day return to us. That should excite us. The disciples undoubtedly believed in particular at that moment that this same Jesus would absolutely come back in the same way to restore his kingdom. They probably believed it. They saw it happen. The angels said it was going to happen. They believed Jesus was coming back. How then were they probably acting at least in the days and weeks that followed this? I'm, I'm, every time I get up, I'm like, <laughs> anybody see him? 
I wouldn't want to take a nap in the afternoon, right? I mean, is it the time of day? Was it whatever time, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, they all walk outside and go, was it going to be this time? The sense of expectation must have made them a little crazy at that point, right? That our Messiah will return from the sky, according to these bright shining dudes who said he is coming back to us. Now, we got to get to work. All of us that know that we have an inspection coming, make sure that our workplace is in order, right? When I knew my classroom was going to be observed, I had my best lesson out, right? I knew my principal was coming. I was ready. I think every day that these guys were living after this, it was like, Jesus is coming back. But then it began to take a little bit longer, right? And he hadn't come back the first week or the first month or the first year or the first five years. The oppression is building. The church is scattered across Central Asia. Martyrs are, are being made and the church is being oppressed and and this is confusing because this same Jesus who was taken up from you has not yet come down in this way. And that was 2,000 years ago. Do we believe this? I think it's hard. I would, I would tell you it's hard to believe. Not in a, a theoretical or even a religious construct that, that Jesus is coming back. I think we believe that. But, but in our hearts, with our lives and our actions, do we believe that the return of Jesus is imminent? The scriptures seem to instruct us in a way that, that understands that we don't, right? That we don't keep our lamps trimmed and burning. That we don't have right behaviors in line with our religion. And we may see a lot more goats than we anticipate when we're separated from the sheep. As it says what happened in Matthew 24, the, 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 the intensity of our are living out this life with a passion, believing that our Savior is coming is probably not present and is therefore evidence that we may not quite believe in this concept. Today we struggle with that a little bit. We struggle with that. There are many dozens of scripture which teach us about the second coming and returning of Christ between 40 and 60 explicit ones, right? That, and then many others that hint at it. And then many more that talk about concepts around it. I mean, whole chapters and some would say the whole book of Revelation indicate the return of Christ. And yet we don't live as if this were central to our lives. I've been trying to work toward a better understanding of um, the rapture and the second coming of Jesus. So I'm going to work through a couple of those ideas today. Dr. David Jeremiah, a very trusted uh, Bible teacher is one who gave me some references. But again, these are his thoughts, right? They're based in Scripture. And I think there is some room for interpretation. But I really, I'm just telling you, I really like the way that he helps me to differentiate between when we talk about the rapture and we talk about Jesus' second coming. Because it really appears to me that there are second comings of Jesus, right? There are at least two appearances of Jesus that are recorded in Scripture in the end times. The rapture and the second coming. I'm going to go through some of the differences that we see in Scripture. Mikey, did you happen to get those? Thank you, because I didn't send my notes to him. He had to enter all this on hand. At the rapture, Jesus comes for his saints. He comes for us. We meet him in the air, right? He comes, the saints see him, we join him, and he raptures, which is a joyous event. All of us who have been saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what occurs at the second coming. He comes with us. Or we come with him. He comes for us at the rapture. He comes with us at the second coming. The scripture tells us we arrive with him. At the rapture, Jesus doesn't come all the way to the earth. At the second coming, his feet touch down on the Mount of Olives in a physical location. And he will reign then on earth. So he takes us to meet him in the sky. He returns with us, or we return with him, to judge the living and the dead on the earth. And Jesus actually descends to the earth at the second coming. At the rapture, Jesus comes with a blessing for his saints. We receive what we have been promised. At the second coming, he brings judgment for those who have not. And finally, the rapture can happen at any moment, but the Bible is clear that the second coming happens seven years after that. 
Well, I didn't remember all this stuff when I started reading it. I think I'd come across most of it. I hadn't connected it explicitly. And I really didn't even take Dr. Jeremiah's at his word. I started reading all the scriptures and backed it up. And I realized, yeah, he's really smart. He read the Bible. He understands it. These things are true. But I encourage you to do your own research on this. Scholars will disagree with the interpretation of the timing of when the rapture will occur. I mean, when it could occur. And I think there's plenty of room to agree to disagree on that non-essential. As well as some of the more specific details. But virtually every Christian faith believes and affirms the second coming of Jesus Christ. Every single human being who's read the word. And whether there are two distinct returns, which I think there's every indication, or one makes really no difference to those of us who adhere to the fact that Jesus Christ is returning. It's interesting how and when these returns occur, but it's not as essential as knowing that Jesus is returning for us. His return and his work is to derive, uh, to, and we need to look at his return and work and, and derive the central truths that we see in Scripture from that. I want to make a little bit of progress in understanding that by reflecting what Jesus himself said when his disciple asked him this question, right? So I think about these things sometimes, and I wish, it's like, Jesus, if you were just like, tell me, Right now, then I would understand. But there's evidence in Scripture that says that even when that occurs, it doesn't help much. Because the disciples would ask him things directly to his face, and Jesus would answer them directly to their face with clear words in their heart language that were the exact words that should be used to answer the question, right? There was no mistake in the answer. They were perfect answers to the question, and these guys still didn't get it. So I think that even if Jesus were here and I were asking him questions and he answered me in his perfect way, I would still struggle. But let's see what actually occurred when the, the disciples themselves said, Jesus, tell us about the end times. Look at Matthew 24. This is in the week or days immediately preceding uh, his, his arrest and trial and murder at the, handle, at the hands of the Jews. So he's speaking to his disciples, delivering these essential truths to them. They seem to be somewhat engaged in the learning process and are asking some of the right questions. And he's talking to them in verse, 20, in verse 1 of chapter 24. Jesus left the temple, was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its building. So they're walking out and they're like, they're, they're, <laughs> they're pointing out to the Son of God how cool the temple is. Does anybody else see the irony there, right? The, the God that not only designed the temple, was there when the first portable temple was made, directed the people to build over dozens, hundreds, hundreds? How many years was it to build a temple? 120 years? Huh? More than six months. It was longer than six months. <laughs> he was there when it was constructed. He made the stones that were the building blocks of the temple. He created the gold that was refined. He grew the cedars of Lebanon that were milled. Everything about that. And the disciples are walking out going, man, hey, boss, would you look at this building? Isn't this temple amazing? It's like... You are the temple, right? I am the one that has contained himself in this temple for centuries. I am walking among you, and these knuckleheads are going, hey, boss, look at the temple. Isn't it amazing? And Jesus responded in a way that I think was probably fairly forceful. There aren't exclamation, exclamation points in this, but this is what he says. Truly I tell you. Do, you. do you see all these things he asked? Truly I tell you, not one stone will be left here on another. Every one will be thrown down. And this was an affront to the Jews to suggest that this would occur. It would be like an Oki bringing a friend to the state capitol and him kind of scoffing and saying, this will all be wiped out. There won't be anything left of this place. Our nation's capital, this place will be leveled someday. We would be offended by that. But way more when the Jewish boys uh, and the Jewish leaders heard Jesus say, this temple will be 
destroyed. You know, archaeologists have discovered that's exactly what happened. In AD 70, the temple was leveled. It was burnt and then destroyed. There is evidence that those that were destroying it literally took pry bars and split open the stones of the temple to recover the gold leaf that had melted off of the roof into crevices in the rock. So it wasn't just the devastation, it was the fracturing of even the very stones of the temple. Jesus was foretelling the complete and absolute destruction of the earthly temple, which had already become irrelevant because those that were in it were no longer worshiping the one true God. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when this happens, when will this happen and what will the, be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? They were talking together, trying to figure this thing out. They decided not to bring it up while they were there around the religious leaders. As Jesus is sitting, relaxing on the Mount of Olives, they ask him this question. And Jesus answers the question that we're now asking ourselves. What's it going to be like when you return and when are you going to return? And this is what he says. Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Wait a minute. Shouldn't I start my, my Christian prepper community and live off, off the grid somewhere in a, in a bunker? If you're alarmed, you should, right? If we're fearful, we definitely should. But Jesus said, don't be fearful. Don't be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginnings of birth pains. The beginnings of birth pains. Now, this kind of stuff just, just I mean, it aggravates me, just to be honest with you. Because um, when do we know in history that there have been wars between nations? Oh, all of history. Okay, that didn't help. What about famines? When do we know that there have been famines? Okay. How about earthquakes? When did they start? Forever, right? So Jesus is being specific, but not specific at all. And so I'm wondering, is it on a scale? There, there are always this sort of tiffs and conflicts, and, but is this the big one? Well, there may be some indication that this is the big one. This idea of Armageddon is woven throughout the revelation of John that we, that we read. The big war. But Jesus says there's going to be all kinds of stuff. But don't worry about that. It's just the birth pains of what's about to happen at the coming. Then he, then he makes it even more cheerful when he says this. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. Man, why did you ask that question? Dude, don't even ask the boss that kind of question again. He is such a downer. I just want to know when you're coming back. What did they, of course, hope he would say? Tomorrow, Monday at the latest, but I will be back soon. And how am I coming back? What do they want to hear? As a conquering king, and you boys are right with me, you will take your place. Beside the king, you will receive the spoils of war. You'll, you'll get what you have coming. Of course, this does happen for us, right? The Bible affirms the promise that we will be restored to infinite riches on the day we are taken to heaven to be with him. But in the meantime, they got a message they probably didn't like. They're going to persecute you. They're going to put you to death. Oh, by the way, every nation on earth will hate you. So when people say this is a Christian nation or that's a Christian nation, or the other's a Christian nation. The Bible doesn't establish any Christian nation. The people of God, we're the family of God, we're the church of God, but there is not a nation of God. Even in Israel, there are a select people, but they are not the nation of God that we see today. Let's continue. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. This is such a tragic irony to me. This is such a tragic irony. You see, pure love 
She get deeper and tighter and stronger the more it's challenged. But what Jesus said was when, when times get tough, people are going to abandon the faith. Their love will grow cold. My life's so hard, I'm not going to church anymore. God didn't bless me with this or my back hurts or my car broke down. I'm not praying to him anymore. I mean, we have that kind of childish response, do we not? We all do. We get angry at God when our life goes badly, our love grows cold. Jesus said this is going to happen across Christianity. Those who say they love me, love me. They are fair weather, friends. And in the foul weather, they will fall away. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. They're, they're saved not because they have stood firm. They have stood firm because they are saved, by the way. We understand that. That the ability and power we have to stand up through anything comes from outside of us through God who has saved us. It will be an indication of the reality of our sanctification and our salvation. In verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the, in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. This is one of the things that drives Wycliffe Bible translators. And the, honestly, the, the electronic platform that we see in version. this is why they're doing this. They literally state this, so that the Lord's return will be hastened. Now, I understand the concept. We can't speed up God's return. He's coming when he's coming, right? But you can go to the Museum of the Bible right now, and there is a really cool room. Uh, it's a, not a huge room. It's probably like this big, and it has thousands of Bibles in the room, thousands. And most of the Bibles, not all, are a particular color, and they tell you what the translation is. And then there are a few hundred of the Bibles that are yellow, and those yellow Bibles are yet untranslated biblical. And some of them were like partially translated, right? So there was like, I think brown or red. It was complete. There were two or three colors. So you could literally see that the promises of God are coming true in our lifetime. And there are people, men and women, who will get up and go to work tomorrow, who will work diligently using the best technology possible to translate the word of God into the heart language of every human being on this earth so that the gospel can be preached to every tribe and every tongue and every nation. And Jesus says, guess what happens then? I'm coming back. Well, this is a little more helpful to me, right? The wars and rumors of wars and famines and all that kind of stuff, the earthquakes, I don't know. Maybe there's a lot now, maybe there's not. I don't have a reference for that. But this, I can put a reference. I can tell you right now that we know exactly how many unreached people groups there are in this nation, or in this world. We know exactly, I don't know, off the top of my head, people know, right? We know exactly how many of those we have put the word of God into their heart language and how many we have taken that to. Now, it does not believe, as I, or state, as I believed one time, that every, now listen, this is a hard truth. You have to wrestle with this. It does not state that every individual in every nation and tribe and tongue will have that gospel presented to them in a biblical form. Now, I personally believe that God, who is not required to do so, will make himself clear to every human being, always has and always will, because he desires that none should perish. But it doesn't mean that everybody's going to have a Bible in their hands. So we're not waiting for that. We're waiting for the declaration of the gospel of Jesus Christ who had been proclaimed to every tribe and tongue and nation. And from that point on, we know that Jesus will come. So verse 15, so when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, the re let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now this is where it gets a little bit confusing. There, This could have been a specific event that occurred in Daniel's time. There was a desecration of the temple during that time. It could have been what was going to occur about 70 AD in the Jerusalem temple or when the Romans desecrated the temple. And it could yet mean a time in our future where the temple is going to be desecrated. 
by the Antichrist. It could be all three. We don't really know when this occurs, but Jesus says at this time, when this occurs, you need to flee to the mountains. An interesting idea. The God who could just put like this like force field around all of his people said, that's not the way I operate. When the oppression comes, I expect you to run from it to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. This is very specific language from Jesus. He is foretelling a day of great turmoil and terror and oppression. It's literal. He said, I don't know the day because only the Father knows the day, but I know that what occurs on that day will be horrific. And for even those of us that are saved by the Son of God, it will be horrible. He said, I just, it's going to be so bad, he said, for those who are pregnant, for those that have Babies are nursing. And I pray that it's not on the Sabbath. You see, the Jews could only travel a half a mile on the Sabbath. They would have been in this impossible, impossible position, knowing that the oppression was here, but they were following God's law, and they could only move a half a mile from it on the Sabbath. He was, he was overwhelmed at the horror that would come on that day. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath, for then... There will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. These end times are not going to be resolved in a post-apocalyptic manner like we see in the movies. We will not be in a, in a just brief twinkling or some sort of nuclear holocaust. It will be a horrific event that occurs, that the world will be imploding under the weight of its own sin before Jesus comes back. And think about this. It's just an appalling thing to, to think about when he says there will never be distress greater than this moment. It'll never be equaled again. Some think this actually occurred at AD 70, that at the time when Jerusalem was leveled and the Christians were oppressed and, and the temple was taken out, that that was that time of distress. I tend to believe it's not yet occurred, that it will occur in the future. Either way, says, verse 22, if those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those that have been chosen by God, those days will be shortened. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it, for false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I've told you ahead of time. I'm going to pause there because I've got a lot more to give you, but I don't have time to give you today. But think about this. Jesus has been asked the specific question by his disciples who are sitting at his feet learning. What's it going to be like when you come back and when are you going to come back? And this is his direct answer. So if we wonder about these things, we should take these words of Christ to heart. We will pick up again on this idea these ideas, these foundational truths of the return of Jesus Christ next week with verse 26. In the meantime, in the meantime, Wednesday night I played a song for the teenagers when we talked about this. Remember the song, Tanya? Well, I wish we'd all been ready. Wish we'd all been ready. This is an old song. If you haven't heard it, it was written in 1969. I didn't hear it until like the 80s, but it was popular in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. It was it was like re-recorded by somebody, I don't know, uh, DC Talk or somebody did it. But basically, it goes on to quote some scripture we're going to read about the fact that there will be two men walking up a hill. One will disappear and the other one will be left standing. There will be a husband and wife or companions in bed. One will hear a noise and turn over and that person will be gone. Two people will be working and in a blink of an eye, one disappears and the other one's left. That's going to be crazy, right? That's going to be truly apocalyptic. That is the moment that everything changes in history for those that have followed Christ and those that have not. I wish we're all ready. 
I wish we'd all been ready. I wish that if today is the day that that occurs, that Jesus appears and raptures his faithful, that everyone in this room and everyone that we hold dear would rise with Christ to meet him in the air. I don't know how we'll manage the sadness when we realize who is not there. I don't know how we'll manage it. Because there will be many, many, many billions of people who have chosen not to follow Christ. The scripture says that. So let's fulfill our work to know God and to make him known to others. Amen? Amen. Father, I thank you for your scripture, for the clarity of the scripture, for the affirmation and beauty of the scripture, but for the terror of the scripture as well. When we read it for all it's worth, it, it should sober us and turn our mind to you and to your universal truths and not our tiny little issues that we have. Thank you for the way it yanks our heads up out of our little, little issues and little problems and little existence and helps us to see the eternal. Maybe just a glimpse of it. Thank you for my friends that are here that would give their attention, that would look past my droning voice into, to hear what the scriptures would say, what the Holy Spirit would reveal. And Father, to take these things that we hear and then to apply them and to use them in our lives. Not to just hear, but to do with what we hear. Thank you for this day. Lord, help us to be doers even this afternoon as we serve some of our seniors from Santa Fe South. Help us to be loving human beings, to care well for these kids today. To respect their families and to show your love through our simple service today. In your name we pray. Amen. A couple of announcements and we will finish up. Burgers and Blessings, the coolest baccalaureate service in the entire country, I guarantee you, because I've been to lots of them, I have a frame of reference, this will be the coolest, because I never got to eat hamburgers at any other baccalaureate service, it'll be this afternoon, which is also cool, normally it's right after church, so you, don't get, you can go home and get a nap for a minute before we come back and take care of these people, or maybe not, but amen. Amen. there you go, we will be back at 3.30. All right, we're going to get things going. We're going to have meat grilled and we're going to have tables set. We're going to have the condiments ready. This is going to feel like a, a time of honoring and partying with our seniors and showing them the love of Christ. If you know a senior from Santa Fe South, tell them they better be here because you can't eat 200 hamburgers by yourself. All right, you need to get them here. To be here, thank you for serving, setting up for Aretha and everybody else who did all of this work without me having to think about it. I'm so grateful to you for that. Um, and then for the grill masters that will be there, I'm going to have a giant grill. If you like to flip burgers, we'll have that going on. Next Sunday is Mother's Day. If you are privileged to still have your mom, and this is especially poignant for Christy and I right now. Her mom was attacked two days ago uh, while walking, uh, exercising in a park in the Dallas area by a bull mastiff, and it could have killed her. Um, it des destroyed oh, 50 plus staples in her head. Her arm was, her shoulder was torn up, her arm. Christy went down to be with her and was just appalled not only at the damage, but her positive attitude um, when this giant animal attacked her. And we realized that anything could have happened. That the damage had been done, we could have lost Grandma Kay this weekend. It is precious to have our moms with us. So we're not going to overlook, overlook that this week. I want you guys to not overlook that. We'll have Mother's Day celebration next week. Invite moms. We'll take family pictures. It's going to be fun to do those family pictures. Uh, I think that Quana is taking those pictures. Is that right? Yeah. Thank you, Quana. I appreciate that. Great idea, Aretha. Anytime you can take something away from me, I love that idea, whatever it is. And May 19th will be our seniors recognized. We have two seniors. Is that right? So we're recognizing our two seniors. And if you've graduated from something and we don't know it, make sure you tell Aretha because I'll forget. But if you've graduated from something, we'd love to celebrate that with you. Mikey, that didn't count. That didn't count. You graduated into old age is all that is. We should probably honor that when you retire. We should throw him a retirement party. Actually, you should throw us your retirement party. That's even better. Mikey's going to throw us a retirement party for him. Wouldn't that be good? This afternoon. <laughs> 
So let's come back today. Obviously, we won't have house church. It'll be here. I'm excited about this. So let's, if we get two seniors or 200 seniors, I don't care. Let's take good care of whoever is here today and celebrate their graduation. Let them know we, we believe in, oh, yes, we launched next week the children's ministry. Do you have your workers? Yeah, next week it's and Excellent. I'm so excited about this. Um, I don't get really, like, joyful about stuff. It's just not in my nature. I'm genuinely joyful about this. I don't show it with my face, but that I am inside. Uh, so grateful. So if you have little ones in your neighborhood, throw them in your car and br- ask the parents. Throw them in the car and then bring them to church next week, right? I would rather have Marissa come in and say, I need four more volunteers than us have everybody ready to go and nobody here next week. But we're still going to be ready to go no matter what, right? Any further announcements? Very good. All right. Would you stand with me? I'm going to ask, I'm going to put him on the spot. I'm going to ask Victor Macias to close us in prayer this morning. Victor, would you close us in prayer? Close us in prayer.